Morris Fideli is a semi-retired practitioner and doctoral researcher at the University of Southern Queensland, Australia. Morris plays a valuable advisory role at the Thrive Project, a four-impact social enterprise that's on a mission to ensure the long-term well-being and thrivability of humanity. Morris discusses how organizations and individuals can understand their sustainability impacts through data-driven machine learning and predictive analytics, and how the Thrive Framework provides a holistic approach for action towards a sustainable world. I wanted to just pick up on what uh, Sunil has said. Um, uh, he's certainly uh, doing a lot of good work uh, in the reference to environmental and ocean governance, and uh, we thank him for taking the time to participate tonight. <clears throat> Now, Sunil talked about many challenges uh, that we have, and indeed, uh, there are uh, several solutions on the horizon. Um, so we need to start with an understanding uh, of um, you know, what we need to measure and indeed what matters most. Uh, so today, I would uh, like to share with you how one can learn to thrive, uh, lessons from the Thrive Framework, which is the science, the technology, and indeed the tools that helps us understand and measure what matters most. So the Thrive Framework is informed by the best and latest uh, scientific and uh, practical understandings. It is an agnostic and holistic approach to thrivability that integrates rather than reinvents uh, what we know is necessary to achieve a prosperous future. Uh, in fact, uh, we know the solutions in many cases. These already exist. Uh, we largely have the science and technology needed to resolve uh, many of our world's pressing challenges. Uh, think of renewable energy, for example, in countries like you know, China, for, for example, who have become a world leader in solar uh, photovoltaic and also um, electric vehicles in less than a decade. Uh, there are many other leading uh, technological solutions out there waiting um, on the willpower, basically, of humanity uh, to be the change needed. So let's get into it. Uh, how do we save humanity and uh, all the species in this world? Let's see, making sure that the slides are working as expected. So there is talk about uh, net zero by 2050. Uh, others like myself argue it should be by 2030 or as soon as possible. Uh, the reality is that humanity is already suffering now and uh, will continue to suffer even more based on these uh, conservative estimates. Uh, think of floods, uh, bushfires, pandemics, uh, mass displacements uh, due to sea level rises, uh, famine, uh, and so forth. The list goes on and on. Uh, we must take radical steps to change our ways of life. Uh, I think this statement uh, echoes uh, what uh, Sunil has been saying as well. So before we uh, get much into it, let's look at some uh, definitions just so there's some clarity around what we're talking about. So sustainability. Uh, this, meets, uh, this means meeting the needs of present generations without compromising the needs of future generations. So sustainability is essentially like the bare minimum required to continue. Uh, this means uh, living hand to mouth day by day. Uh, and that's the current uh, status quo, whereby our efforts are not sustainable currently. So we do not have this as it stands. So in other words, um, you cannot continually take from uh, one person to feed another because there are finite resources. Uh, in terms of thrivability, uh, this is going beyond sustainability, uh, so beyond um, just break even. Uh, Thrive believes humanity uh, can um, do this, can achieve this, uh, aspiring people and nature to flourish or thrive. Uh, thrivability focuses on the importance of quality of life. So sustainability inspires us to get back to zero, whereas thrivability aims for net positive going on to the other side. So we're currently uh, negative and we need to get onto the positive side, uh, not just back to zero. So what is the solution? Well, luckily there are scientists and organizations like the Thrive Project hard at work on developing these. Primarily involves education and global collective action. Uh, I stress that last part. Uh, 
Uh, so, yeah, why us? Uh, why Thrive? Well, uh, recently, uh, the Thrive Framework, which is one of our key offerings, has been spotlighted as a key data platform for further disseminating and uh, implementation of the indicators. Now, this refers to uh, a recent uh, study. It was featured in a follow-up report in connection with a pilot study by the United Nations Research Institute on Social Development, uh, looking at thresholds of transformations. So our work is seen as a gold standard in approach to the challenges of how to become a thrivable society. So next, I'd like to share with you a little bit about our journey on discovering the answers, uh, or more precisely, in providing the providence uh, and developing the path ahead towards prosperity. So we have three arms to the organization that uh, are uh, involved with these uh, aspects and uh, indeed globally uh, we work at these. So research is where we have a, collect, uh, a collection of uh, experts in global sustainability. Uh, this is covering from astrophysics to zoology. Uh, we believe in science uh, to plot the path uh, or the best path forward and as such are part of a group of uh, 2400 plus almost 2500 now organizations worldwide dedicated to solving these challenges the challenge is so grandiose that we can't expect any one organization to solve it all but we're certainly taking a very uh, instrumental part in the process uh, the other aspect is uh, education. We provide an extensive information resource on current thrivability matters, uh, as well as an informative uh, presentation, so, such as the webinar this evening. Uh, we also have a regular podcast series on a thrivable future. Uh, we have uh, journal articles, conference exposés, and other weekly sort of publications. And lastly, and probably uh, most importantly, is advocacy. In other words, once uh, the research is done and people uh, are educated about the situation we find ourselves in, how do we ensure people take action for the better? So we speak to the community on sustainability issues and we encourage action as well as partnerships with industry, academia and corporations and have ongoing collaborations with like-minded uh, individuals and organisations around the world, such as Sunil here. So who uses uh, Thrive? This is a question that, um, that comes up. So uh, who has been using the Thrive platform? This is our first case study as such. So the Thrive flat pl platform is, uh, provides business analysts and consultants with tools to guide strategy. That's one group. Um, the Thrive Platform assists researchers to analyze trends and effectiveness of entity models for sustainability, such as a business model or a governance model. It allows governments to build scenarios and forecast the effects of regulatory or legislative actions that they may take. It uh, encourages businesses to do uh, good to do well in their pursuit uh, for a competitive advantage. Uh, is used by media to disseminate the message uh, broadly and provoke uh, action among civil uh, society for the benefit of all humankind. And empowers individuals, consumers, people like you and I, to actively stimulate comp uh, competition among entities uh, for voting um, with their wallets. So, uh, for example, um, you know, you could be boycotting an organization that's been less sustainable than another, uh, as a simple example. More on this practical examples a little later. Uh, so in terms of uh, use cases, uh, just to give an idea of the distribution, around about half are consumers who are finding value in the work that we do. Now, the next few slides will be quite academic and technical and beyond the scope of tonight's presentation. So I will be skimming over them. Uh, however, uh, this is just to encourage uh, those that may be interested uh, to follow up and have a closer look. Uh, there is a large amount of materials, including audiovisuals and slide decks, journal papers and more, providing in-depth details, all connected to our website. 
but just briefly, just to give you uh, an idea of the sort of things you could find out. So uh, part of our work was to conduct an extensive detailed review of approaches, methods and tools that have been developed, uh, specifically this studies over the last 15 years. Uh, and there was an appraisal done of what is out there and um, to better understand um, how useful um, what has been done to date. But then going beyond that, looking at indeed what we need to actually do to have the right tools on hand. Uh, this was uh, pretty much the kernel that came about in germinating what is now become the Thrive framework and the Thrive uh, platform. So this was a summary study that was released just last year, but the work took place more like seven years or so ago. Okay, scale linking um, across the seven C's as we call. So this is about measuring impacts within norms, uh, which is an extremely important concept that is often overlooked by most uh, assessment methods out there. So we live on a finite planet. Um, so let me illustrate with an example. So um, the impacts that one has is in relation to the ecosystem in which they one may operate in. So in my local neighborhood, maybe there's, let's say, 100,000 households. And just to make things simple for computation, let's say that uh, the local uh, dam produces 100,000 litres of water a day. Uh, with 100,000 households, quick uh, calculation, everyone gets a litre of water. Now, um, obviously, some households uh, may have elderly people or young folks in it and would have particular reasons to use more or less, but this, let's just go with one litre of each just to make things simple. Now, if I consume two litres of water today, that means my neighbour go thirst, goes thirsty. Um, if he consumes also two litres, uh, his neighbour will go thirsty, etc. And you can get away with this for a limited period of time, but there will come a point that there will be someone who will not get any water. Uh, and they will, if this happens on a repeated basis, they will eventually die. This is how we are using resources on the planet currently. We're treating it like an infinite supply, but it's not. So the concept of scale linking is to ensure that we're actually measuring what we're using with respect to actually what's available and to be fair about it in the way things are used and allocated. So I'll leave this point to that. Um, maybe there might be some questions later in the Q&A about it, but this is a very uh, big part of the way the assessment is done that is often not done by other uh, approaches or not employed by other approaches. This here refers to what we call the uh, 12 foundational uh, focus factors. Uh, again, uh, beyond the scope of tonight's uh, presentation, but those interested in the theoretical underpinnings of the Thrive Framework, how it comes about, how it works, uh, there's over 14,000 man hours has gone into this. Uh, please do have a look at the source there. You could follow up and understand more about it. These 12 foundational focus factors have actually been put into a diagram which is known as a systemic holistic model. Uh, again, beyond the scope of going through this uh, this evening, but just be aware that um, that uh, this uh, diagram exists. Uh, and the systemic holistic model is looking at a solution that is holistic, in other words, works across the whole world, and looking at solutions which are systemic. Um, so in other words, we have existential threats, as Sunil pointed to. These are threats that cannot be addressed with a band-aid. They're not a, something that can be just fixed for the minute. We actually need solutions that are all pervasive uh, and are solutions that affect all of society. So the systemic holistic model brings us together to ensure that we measure the significance, we measure the scale, also the scope, and then implement the shift that's necessary to transition us from where we are at now to where we actually ought to be. So this allows us to have the understanding uh, of the interconnectedness of the issues faced and develop necessary and sufficient solutions to our global challenges through simulations, predictive analytics, and you know, scenario analysis and so forth. You might have seen this before. It's an instant visualization of actually the impacts that we're having. Again, uh, won't go through any details, but one of these diagrams can explain to you very quickly and succinctly what's actually going on. And you will see this throughout 
uh, our uh, materials on our website. And um, if you've had any uh, dealings or business to do with Thrive, you would have seen this somewhere else as well, particularly in our logo. This is symbolic of the work that we do. Uh, you also see it on the, on the app somewhere. Again, this is a uh, fairly technical sort of information. Uh, this is about Sprint, which is our a system which links the strategy of uh, each of the entities that we examine uh, with the actual impact. So if you're looking at, say, business, you might be looking at the business model, their strategy compared to their impact. Could be looking at industry sector. You could be looking at a portfolio if you're a fund manager, for example or a governance model. So are we making wise choices in terms of investing in uh, actions that are towards sustainability or indeed thrivability, as we would be saying? This is a sustainability performance scorecard, which is visually what you see when you actually use the Thrive uh, framework. So now let's examine an industry which is in uh, line of uh, the work that uh, Sunil is, he's an environmental and ocean uh, governance uh, specialist. And in particular at Thrive, we have used the platform to evaluate uh, this particular uh, part of industry. So, um, yeah, reviewing uh, the tool is, as I said, beyond the scope of what we'll do right here. Um, and, uh, yeah, you can follow up the documentation uh, for that. But the uh, Practical example here related to ocean governance, um, which you know, Sunil shared his thoughts about it tonight, um, is what we're going to look at here. So um, if you were in the room, I would ask you who, who saw uh, Sea Spiracy. Um, actually, we've written an article uh, on the same. Hopefully you've had a look at that. Um, but hopefully some of you might have seen that. So the Thrive platform evaluated the seafood industry. Uh, in particular, we looked at the top 30 keystone actors who control most of the industry. This is what uh, Amanda mentioned at the beginning of today's session. Um, we did the evaluation looking at their uh, employment methods, uh, their training, their fair policy, fair pay policy, slavery. There's a lot of slavery and a lot of abuse in this sector, unfortunately. Uh, looking at all the environmental concerns, plastics in the ocean, uh, um, uh, ocean acidification, uh, overfishing. Um, by the way, we have an animation series on this. If anyone's interested, uh, please have a look at our channels about that. Um, human displacement due to climate change as a re result of sea level uh, rises. Uh, again, um, the opening picture that uh, Amanda shared with us uh, this evening about the Maldives and also there's other places like Kiribati. These are island nations literally going underwater during, uh, due to sea level rises because of uh, climate action, for example. Uh, carbon emissions, of course, from logistics, things like storage and transportation. Um, you know, uh, who's ever bought here a fish that was local, for example? You know, uh, there's obviously a lot of... Uh, cost, environmental cost that goes into uh, all of the distribution that goes with it and many, many more. Uh, so in this example, um, over 60 indicators were examined and millions of, of data points. So let's see if I can uh, share what this looks like. Um, so this is the example of some of the labels or the brands of the organizations in question. and. The idea would be say, well, which ones are more sustainable or less sustainable than another? You know, which one should you uh, indulge in? You may say, well, I don't eat uh, seafood at all, and that's fine. That's great. Uh, but for those who do, and many people in the world live by the ocean, that's their only source of uh, protein. Um, you know, it may be you know a, a fishing or a village. Uh, along uh, the beach side where the dad or the family goes out and um, you know, picks up the fish for the whole family for the day. That's the only way they actually live and survive. Uh, they don't go to shops as such. Um, so, again, uh, we're not going to be going into these slides given the time commitments that we have today, but I just uh, to show you what you could see in regards to the seafood index if you go into the Thrive Framework. Uh, in the Thrive platform, where we examine all of these sort of key things. But I will share with you some ideas around the, some of the key areas. So looking at um, 
uh, entity models, looking at how the choices of how we do things, uh, how organization work, how our bioregion is supported, uh, how an uh, individual industry or portfolio uh, um, makes decisions about what to invest in, for example. Also looking at, um, uh, I referred to earlier about the different levels, so making sure that we're measuring impacts relevant to what's actually available. Uh, so famously, you might recall how Apple was uh, asking for its uh, old phones to be returned to Apple when you, in, you know, buy a new one uh, and even gave you a kickback for doing so. The main reason is to actually get the materials back because the cost of going to mine those materials is far higher than actually having those materials uh, at hand already, firstly. And, um, you know, principally, all of the materials can be reused. But secondly, is the fact there is a finite amount of those materials. There's only so much lithium in the ground. There's only so much cadmium. There's only so much selenium, etc. Uh, you know, there will come a point that some of these uh, materials, even though they may be in large quantities at first, are going to run out. Uh, as Sunil pointed to, people think about the ocean is so vast, so big, uh, there's you know, kind of like an infinite supply, but there isn't. It's still finite. And we are using, uh, aggressively using more and more resources all the time. So analyzing how much we're using with respect to how much there is available and making a fair distribution so that we don't have the last neighbor going thirsty, as I made the, uh, the example before, is an important part of the whole process. Uh, most of society is driven by consumerism, as you probably will aware, and, and eternal growth, etc. So we're normally asked to keep on buying, keep on buying, keep on buying, keep on making, keep on using. But the reality is we're going to run out. So we need to think of other strategies. Again, not going to go into equations for anyone here, but certainly uh, modeling does um, entail quite a fair amount of mathematics, heuristics and so forth. So we'll skip those, conscious of the time. So we come back here to, to the different brands that were showcased. There's over 300, but these were some of the icons. The question was, which is the organization that's actually came up best in terms of impacts, um, having the, uh, uh, the least uh, um, negative sort of effects or the greatest positive effects, if you can use that. Interesting, the highest score was only about uh, 54%, I think, something like that, in, the, in 50 to 60%. That was the highest score. Anyhow, the organization came out on top is an organization called Thigh Union. Now, whenever I mention that, unless you happen to be maybe from a place like Tha you know, Thailand, Thailand, I should say, um, people say, who are they? Never heard of them. Um, and rightfully so, most of us haven't heard of this organization. Uh, but people are asking, you know, what label should I be looking? Next time I go to the store and I buy my salmon in a tin, what should I be buying if I want to be more sustainable? So in the next uh, few seconds, I'm going to share some of this with you without naming them. If you see some animations happening, you'll know who they are. These brands are worldwide, so depending where you are in the world, you may have seen or may have not seen a particular brand. Many people have probably heard of that last one. So Thai Union is actually the uh, body that owns those particular brands. And uh, if you want to make more sustainable choice, that would be an example. Now we could do this across the board. Think of clothing, think of uh, fresh produce, think of many, many other products, all the electronic products that we buy and so forth. Wouldn't it be great to be able to decide when you go into the store, which one you're gonna buy because you wanna do the right thing. Um, not about price, not about brand name, but about doing the most sustainable choice, the right thing for this environment, this planet we live in. Thrive platform and the Thrive framework overall provides us the answers to this. Again, beyond the scope of what we're going to go into now, um, this is uh, a collation of the data that you saw earlier in the form of a uh, diagram, um, just to give you an idea. And similar here with insights. So to summarize for the seafood industry, since this is the example that we're looking at here, 
The findings from the pilot showed that a maximum sustainability performance index score achieved among those companies was about two point, just shy of 2.7. This is only 54% of the maximum achievable score of five. So a lot to be desired, of course. This is the highest, this is the most sustainable organization uh, according to the data that we analyzed. 70% uh, of the companies uh, with a score more than one uh, had a score of more than one, followed by a similar business model, uh, followed a similar business model, which is of the green supply chain. So this is the more prevalent model among the more, more sustainable organization uh, to have actual green supply chain in place. Uh, more than 90% of the companies uh, focused um, on this model in that group. And the most commonly uh, what we call business model pattern combination, which is a pattern of strategies, was the one listed there. Again, beyond the scope of tonight to go into all the technical sort of details. Um, after green supply chain, the next major uh, choice we saw was organizations that were maximizing their material productivity and energy flow. So um, this is to say that the others were not actually doing this. So, whilst you, you might think that many organizations are taking on board the message about being more sustainable, about being thrivable, <clears throat> about em employing best practices um, in this regard, generally speaking, uh, they are not. So, um, you know, um, these companies, as I said, they contribute to 30% of the total revenue um, of all of the uh, companies that were, all the 30 companies that were examined. So, that gives you some insight for uh, seafood uh, stewardship, um, which is a small part of ocean governance. Um, ocean governance uh, does cover a number of other aspects, things like, for example, which a lot of people would relate to, plastics in the ocean. Um, most of the plastic that uh, gets disposed of these days, even the one that goes into um, you know, garbage cans can go to landfill, etc. A lot of that leaches out and gets, or, or microplastics even, gets into rivers and then eventually into the ocean. So that's a big issue. Uh, the nitrous oxide cycle that uh, Sunil talked about, um, you know, uh, ocean acidification, um, the, you know, because the ocean is a very large carbon sink, uh, just like forest on land. Uh, we also have mangroves and other aspects of how the ocean work, which provides a carbon sink for us. So there are many aspects of ocean governance, very, very important parts that really affect uh, humankind in a um, significant way. And we have been the reason, largely the reason for its uh, destruction. Uh, other animal life forms are also affected. So, um, you know, plant life, etc. So, yeah, we're doing a lot of bad things and we need to do better. And the science that comes out of the Thrive Framework um, helps us, informs us, guides us, uh, illuminates the way forward of how we can actually become indeed a sustainable and a thrivable society in the long run. Thank you.